The following production is part of the We Be Geeks Podcast Collective. From days long ago, from uncharted regions of the universe, comes a legend. The dream that came through a million years, that lived on through all the tears. It came here, the Fandom Nexus. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to our host as he plugged in his microphone. I have a podcast! Here he is, your spider pan, Jeremy. Yes, greetings, it's me! It's me, your spider pan, Jeremy, and uh, it looks like I'm flying solo. Uh, I had tried to set things up where uh, where Phil was going to be joining me again today. Uh, don't know what happened. It's getting difficult to coordinate timing with everyone, uh, so I'm doing more and more shows on my own. Uh, you know, he's, of course, a busy uh, pastor, and uh, both of us have some health issues. Uh, I actually was planning to record maybe yesterday, but I wasn't feeling that well. Last couple of weeks, I'm sorry, I just I wasn't feeling well, and uh, I'm adjusting to uh, getting back on some medication and whatnot. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what happened there, and now that we're also having evening church, Philip is kind of busy on Sundays, and that's when I'd like to record the show to get it out to you by Monday, but here it is Monday, and I'm recording the show now, and I tried to coordinate with Philip, but now I can't find him. So here I am on my own, but we have lots of fun to have together, you and I, as we've got the Flash movie has been out now for a week. I meant to have the review last weekend. Uh, Philip and I got a chance to go and see that. Also, there's a Stanley documentary. I uh, also got an opportunity to go to an event here in Kansas City, the Spider-Man Beyond Amazing exhibit out at our Union Station. Now, I think this might be a touring type of a thing, so this is something you might have the opportunity to go on and check out yourself. Uh, I did not get a chance to see the Spider-Man, uh, what is this one, Across the Spider-Verse? I don't know. The the newest Spider-Verse cartoon. <laughs> Didn't get a chance to see that one. Things always kept getting in the way, and then, of course, The Flash came out. There's a lot of movies that have come out. Uh, I'm actually curious about that that uh, Wes Anderson movie, The Asteroid City. I'd like to check that one out as well. Elemental has come out as well. Uh, not planning on seeing that one. I have really kind of given up on Disney and Pixar. Uh, I, I've been getting kind of the mix of people that enjoy it and people who haven't, and I'd rather not pay money for it because, you know, I've read some stuff. And I just can't get down with the program over there anymore. I uh, really just cannot do it. So... Uh, I'm not planning to see it. I'll probably just see it when it pops up on Disney Plus. If if I watch it, if big if huge if, uh, and this is that's disappointing. Pixar used to be like you know some of my favorite movies you know of the recent years were coming from Pixar, but they really kind of went downhill and then just start putting out just terrible movies. Uh, I haven't liked one of their movies since. Uh, well, I liked the um the one I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. Wow. The one with the fish. <laughs> I liked that one. But they haven't seemed to really hit the stride that they had uh, before. I mean, they've put out some movies that were good and then some movies that were just awful and some movies that were just okay. Uh, but it used to be every one was just a, a banger of a movie, and uh, I really don't feel like they've done that, uh, and neither has Disney. Uh, but, yeah, uh, we could go on for a long time about that, but I won't. All right, but let's get into some things. Uh, of course, of course, we like to ask the question, what have you been watching? And uh, as of today, I watched the first episode of Secret Invasion from Marvel. Now, this, of course, is based off a, a comic book event that happened in Marvel that uh, I, I didn't read at all. Uh, I, I had gotten to a point where all I was really reading was just Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, because to try to keep up with all of it is really difficult and gets really expensive, and I just don't have that kind of cash flow. Uh, I didn't then, and I, I don't now, so <laughs> I didn't really get a chance to read all of this different event, but uh, the series is based off of that, or the television series is based off that Marvel Comics event, and this is, of course, where the scrolls have been secretly invading the Earth and swapping themselves out for various people, including Spider-Woman uh, was actually, I like, the Scroll Queen or something like that. Uh, that ended up being kind of a big deal, and it, it turns out it had been she'd been swapped out for quite some time, and they even had a, uh, a Spider-Woman series after it was all over with where she was trying to regain people's trust again because she'd missed out on a large chunk of her own life, and uh, they... Made a really neat little comic, then even a motion comic uh, that you could view 
uh, with her getting trying to get back into her own life and getting going on a bit of an adventure. The artwork was really neat on that one. I did collect that. It was a neat series. So, yeah, that's uh, the first episode came out. We just kind of got started. They're adapting it in a way to where you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe had established that Nick Fury and Carol Danvers were attempting to help the Scrolls find a new home planet, uh, which was different because the Scrolls are usually uh, Marvel villains. Uh, they typically get in fights with the Kree and, of course, frequently fight with the, the Fantastic Four. In fact, you've got a Super Scroll that has all the powers of each member of the Fantastic Four. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever see anything like that pop up in this particular series. We are waiting for the Fantastic Four. That is coming, but it's not here yet. So I don't expect to see that. I would like to see some super-powered scrolls, although it did appear in this series that scrolls are definitely stronger than a human when they fight with each other, because we do have a couple scrolls getting uh, into a fight, because we have at least one scroll that is on the human side, and some scrolls that are not involved, but... Uh, uh, this has got a leader named Gavik who is uh, recruiting some of the younger scrolls. It feels like the promise has not been kept of them getting them their own home world. It's like, well, you know what? You got a nice planet. We'll just take it. Uh, and uh, they've got a plot going to uh, basically remove humanity from the picture and take the planet for themselves. And I believe this is supposed to be an eight episode arc or eight episode series. So we'll just see how that turns out. I have a feeling the humans are somehow now going to remain on this planet, but this could have ramifications in upcoming Marvel features. So what have I been playing? Well, I've actually been doing some repeat playing. I, I'm still working my way through God of War Ragnarok, but I'm trying to just kind of mix it up. Um, I went back and had to play a bit of the Final Fantasy VII remake. Partly, I was kind of excited seeing the footage of the next, in the Final Fantasy VII, I believe it's Rebirth, getting to see that. Got me kind of excited to go back and play with the old Final Fantasy VII. Plus... I was trying to update. I, I I think I've got everything squared away. Uh, I've probably got some more videos I need to work on and put on there, but at least it'll it'll you'll get a new video every day if you happen to subscribe to the official Neverland Gaming channel. Uh, I've got uh, basically one hour episodes uh, of of Final Fantasy VII Remake popping up every day for a while until it runs out. And I had to go through. I was missing some video from my previous playthroughs, so I had to go and replay some areas. So, uh, and then you can definitely tell the difference between. Like when I'm playing on a PS5 and how, how high the quality of the videos you could save on that is uh, versus me streaming on a PS4 and having a microphone. And uh, it on the PS4, it didn't quite look as good. It's like the um, the uh, resolution was was dropped a little bit there. So you can definitely see some difference. Uh, and you can hear me talk in the beginning. You can even see some of these clips will have the old Neverland to Disney and Beyond logos on the front of it instead of the... Uh, the official Neverland Gaming channel because I had stuff on just one channel and I've, I've been consolidating to where there's a gaming channel and a podcast channel and then just my personal channel on YouTube. Uh, they're actually on two different email accounts. But I've been trying to clean this up and keep in my main YouTube for if I just post something up myself and also I've got another channel that I've put up that it's uh, all my professional work because uh, you never know when that might be useful to have, oh, here's the ads I've made, here's where I've done voiceover and ads and all this kind of thing. All of my work, you know, well, not all of it, but I mean, selections of my work is available on YouTube if anyone happens to look that up under my own name. So I've been playing through the Final Fantasy VII Remake, and then I started up actually last, uh, so I guess on Saturday I was playing a little bit even before I got started here today, waiting for Philip. Uh, the Spider-Man PS5 Remastered, uh, I've been playing with that mainly because I got kind of excited to play it after going to that Spider-Man a, a, a Beyond Amazing event or exhibit that I went to on Saturday. It kind of inspired me to come back and play with it a little bit. And I'm going to talk all about that exhibit here later on. But I'm having a good time just playing through it. Uh, it's just it's just a great game. And, of course, we've got the sequel coming up in October. And uh, I am, of course, just like you, I'm sure, excited to play it. Spanning the Disney and Geek Universe to bring you the best in comics, toys, movies, and entertainment. This is news from around Neverland. All right. Well, the first thing I've collected for some news, uh, this is just some neat stuff. This is the type of thing we can cover now. Dear Softball, I fell in love with you when I was a little girl, always carrying around my glove, throwing tennis balls off the wall, and hitting with my dad in the park. I played with the boys when there was no softball, 
and then finally switched over once recruiting started. And that's when it started to get serious. I hungered for competition and strived for excellence. But for a while, you were something that my hands had such a tight grip on. My identity was tied so tightly to a game that leads to failure almost all of the time. And I rode the roller coaster of emotions. Then I met Jesus. I learned I have a loving father who died for my sins and has a plan for my life, a plan to give me a hope and a future. My perspective changed when I realized you were just something I did, not who I was. Jesus tells me who I am and I wanted to bring this light into the softball world and play the game differently. I was so blessed to have the opportunity to attend the best university in the country and play for the best program imaginable. Yes, winning a few national championships and winning some personal honors is amazing and I will never take that for granted. But it is so much greater than what goes on on that dirt. First, I have met some of my best friends and my future husband at OU. Praise the Lord. But even more so, the Lord has given me a platform to shine a light that the world tries to dim. The expectation is to idolize you, and the promise is that true joy comes from reaching a goal that you have put all of your effort into. Yes, we as Christians are expected to work hard at all that we do for Christ, but the real victory has already been won on the cross, Jesus dying for my sin and saving me. Because of this, I have an eternal hope that allows me to play your game free with fullness of joy that comes only from the Lord. With this mindset, I have played the most joyful softball the last five years. What's crazy is that this joy doesn't come after big wins, home runs, championships, etc., because all of those things will fade away. I am filled with a steadfast joy when I see one of my teammates decide to get baptized and become a sister in Christ. I will never forget worshiping with my teammates, singing the song Nobody in center field after winning the second national championship. God is so awesome. My prayer when I started college was that I could be a vessel that the Lord uses in his kingdom to bring others to know him. As I leave college softball, I pray that others can know how loved they are by the creator of the world and that Jesus can use you in mighty ways. You just need to be willing and obedient. I'll end with one of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Sincerely, Grace Lyons. All right, so that's a video that was put up by the NCAA Championships, Oklahoma's Grace Lyons, reading her Dear Softball Letter. Uh, she is, I believe, graduating from uh, the Oklahoma University, and uh, her softball team won the NCAA Championships, and they've been going viral for the press conference they had right afterward. And uh, I thought it was some really, 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 really neat uh, videos coming out from them, and I enjoyed watching this one. And uh, I, cu- I figured it was news. That is something. That are, this is how much this show has changed. I feel more free to share things like that with you. And uh, I really enjoyed that. That was some good news, you know, uh, for a change. Of, of course, it's been a couple of weeks now since they've won, uh, and, and some videos went viral of them. But I wanted to share that with you because I thought it was some good stuff. We also have some sad stuff to share. But this is, uh, you know, this is good remembrance of life, and this is also going to fit in nicely with the, me going to that exhibit. But uh, John Victor Romita Sr., uh, January 24th, 1930 to June 12th, 2023. Uh, what it's, it, of course, you're probably familiar with his work, uh, if you're familiar with the comics, on The Amazing Spider-Man, uh, co-creating characters including Mary J. Watson, The Punisher, Wolverine, and Luke Cage. Uh, he was, of course, a comic book artist and had a very uh, interesting style. Uh, he actually was a ghost artist in 1949 working for Timely Comics, which is you know what, what would later become Marvel. And this is where he met Stan Lee. In 1951, Romita began drawing horror, war, and romance comics for Atlas Comics, which had been known as Timely and became Atlas and would later become Marvel. Uh, He also drew some of his first superhero work in 1950s, revival of Captain America. And then he started actually working for DC Comics from 1958 to 1965 and was an artist for many of their romance comics. And uh, he got really good at drawing beautiful women and became pretty well known for it. Uh, I'm I'm sure, uh, was it uh, J. Scott Campbell uh, might be more known for it now these uh, he came back to Marvel in 65, drawing Daredevil. And in 66, when Dit- Steve Ditko left Marvel, which if you've seen the Stanley documentary, you'll get to see a little bit about that. And I had to, you know, I'll, I'll get into that here a little bit later why Steve Ditko left. But this is when John Romita was chosen by Stan Lee to be the new artist for Amazing Spider-Man. And he really, he, uh, 
He made it. He he put a bit more muscle on Spider Man. He had a very unique style. It was very very cool of when he drew Spider Man, and uh, I'm always mainly going to remember that uh, more than you know his work on Captain America because I mean I I wasn't around during the time he was drawing, but his signature style lived on through the '60s and was brought to life in animation and things like that. Uh, so he really did some neat stuff. Uh, and I, there is a fun little bit here. It says Romita said he based the design of Mary Jane Watson on actress Anne Margaret, which you might know her from Viva Las Vegas and some other things. Uh, I remember her being actually guest starring in an episode of The Flintstones. And they had a really cute drawing of her uh, that they made and uh, called her, I think, Anne Margaret Rock. But she was disguised as Annie and she showed up as Pebbles. A nanny or nurse, uh, so, you know, I guess a nanny would be the thing. And so, but Pebbles figured out exactly who she was because she was singing songs to her, but she'd always tell Pebbles, Shh, you know, can't tell anybody. It's a really cute episode, but yeah, uh, very, very, very cool. And uh, he actually here recently came back and was doing a little bit more uh, work. Uh, and his son, uh, John Romita Jr., has actually done some work on both Uncanny X Men and Spider Man and also on The Punisher. Uh, he's got a very different style from his father, but his, his style is also very distinct. Uh, it, it, it's a style that kind of grew on me after a while, but when I first was seeing him, uh, his work on Uncanny and Kenny X Men, I really didn't like John Romita Jr.'s work. It's kind of blocky in style, but I always liked John Romita's look, and a lot of uh, poster work and stuff you could see uh, was carried over from his style of artwork. Uh, so very, very, very sad loss, but uh, he left a heck of an impact on Spider-Man fans and Marvel fans alike. The only other bit of news that I had is this. We have hit the 35th anniversary of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and I thought that was just kind of fun and unique. I haven't heard of any sort of special events going on, but, you know, if you need a good reason to watch it, there's your reason. Other than, of course, you know, today that I'm recording is actually June 26th, and that's 626. So if you want to watch Lilo and Stitch, today's a good day for that as well. Uh, but I think I'm going to have to watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I haven't watched it in a while, so... Yeah, celebrate that 35th anniversary. And hey, if you go back, I guess it was last year, we did have Gary K. Wolf, the creator of Roger and Jessica Rabbit, on the show to talk about one of his new books. So uh, having a good celebration, you can go back and visit that episode as well. But now it's time we visited the trailer park. Mama, now the gator got in the house. Now the gator? Give me that sugar. Come here. Oh. Get him, Mama. Oh. Get that gator. Ah. Yeah. Ah. The Neverland Trailer Park. Okay, so this trailer, I'll admit, is a little different from what we normally have. This is a Netflix documentary, and I had to do it because I live in Kansas City. I'm a Kansas City Chiefs fan and a fan of uh, good old Patrick Mahomes. This is a Netflix documentary called Quarterback. Let's go upstairs now and read, okay? Why does the NFL have so many rules against hitting quarterbacks? The quarterback throwing a pass is wide open for dangerous hits. An injury to the quarterback can sink a team's entire season. I'm going to take you out of here. No. I'm good. This is about as close as they'll ever get to seeing what it's like to be a quarterback in this league. I dedicate my life to football. All day. All day. I love to compete. I love the relationships that come with that. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. He's four. He's down. Oh, I would have gotten up. Everybody sees the game days, but they don't see the day-to-day grind. Every season's a roller coaster. Hey, you get one opportunity a week. Marcus will keep it in score. Let's go! It's really nice to get him away from football and spend time with our family. <laughs> she made it the first try. How many did y'all make? I can do that one. I said, wait. Just kind of a basic guy. We call it dad style. If ever I do go out of my shell, it seems to become a thing. Dive Let's in. go. This was the turducken. You get one game plan, one game, then a completely different game plan the next. That's a good oh, hit, that was a great play, dog. Oh. I know what I signed up for. You just got to be able to buck with your chin strap up. I'm here all day. I'm here all day. I'm here all day. My instinct has always been, I'm going to be the guy to make the play. And I think that kind of gets me in trouble. Let's go out there and find a way to drag our the finish line. Mahomes 
is in trouble, scrambling to his right. I said, wait. Gets off the hip. And the first and late caught. Touchdown! I'm like that. So this is coming to Netflix on July 12th. I'm going to attempt uh, to go back. There's a little bit of mild language in that trailer. I'm going to attempt to do it and see if I can edit some of that out. So either you heard it, get edited out, or you heard me miss it uh, as part of sentences. It's going to be a bit of a challenge for me to <laughs> edit out, but I'm going to attempt to edit that out for you. But I, I've got to say, I'm pretty excited. If you're a football fan, uh, I'm not sure about everybody who's in this, uh, the different quarterbacks they talk to, but of course, Patrick Mahomes, who you hear the most of, and you get to see uh, some stuff with his family. There's a really fun little shot where they show his wife uh, getting a ball into like a, the milk barrel, like a game. And, uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes doesn't quite get it in there, but uh, he has one where you got to throw a football through a hole. And he's like, yeah, I can do that one. Uh, Los Glycolay also go and follow around Kirk Cousins. And uh, uh, I believe he's a quarterback for for Minnesota. I want to say uh, I could be getting that wrong, but uh, I remember him, of course, getting a lot of attention when he uh, they had some fun on the plane, and he's wearing a bunch of gold chains and and stuff, and he's kind of out of his normal comfort zone, and that's kind of what they mentioned. But it looks like it's going to be a very interesting and fun uh, uh, show to watch if you happen to be a football fan. I think you will enjoy that, and I am a football fan, so I plan to enjoy watching that on July twelfth. Also, if you were, might remember Studio C, uh, they have a YouTube channel. I think they've also had, uh, if you happen to be part of the uh, Latter-day Saints Church, um, they uh, they came out of that group of uh, entertainment. Uh, you know, I'm not with the LDS. Eric is. Um, but I, I find that they're, you know, good, clean comedy. I enjoy that. But they have apparently, uh, well, Studio C... Uh, I think this is the group that was the original ones on the uh, on the main show, and they've branched off to try to make their own way, and I have seen one of them even pop up at a commercial. But uh, this is a movie called Go West that's coming to theaters July 19th, and uh, I saw this, and I was like, well, hey, you know, this could be fun. So here is that trailer. They're now known as J.K. Studios, by the way. It's the cursed widow Jenkins. Mm, it's too bad she's cursed. I was wondering where she went. In the small town of Independence, Missouri, sat the lonely widow, Aveline Jenkins. On to the next one. Her husband's death prepared her for many things, but nothing could prepare her for what came next. Oh, no! What is it? My eczema. My daughter, she's getting married. Oh, that's great. She's 15. Historically, still great. I have to go west now. You should just go without me, and I'll catch up. Or not. To your wagons! You want me to trade a covered wagon for a handcart? It'll reduce your carbon footprint. Consider that. From the original cast of Studio C. Why does he have band-aids on his nipples? Yeah, he's a runner. Who knows why any of those sickos do what they do? Well, that's what I would do. I'm suffocating. <laughs> what do you want? I want my half cent, you thieving enchantress. Ooh, I'm stuck. I'm quite stuck. Who's the luckiest girl in the world? It's me. I believe oxen are much more depressed than I realize. Well, how to do? Narrated by Sean Astin. Shall we be off then? Westwood Hill, my comrades. Oregon Trail, here I come. I got the dysentery down in my bowels. Where? Down in my bowels today. And if that chamber pot don't like it, it can sit on it. Ouch! Sit on a tack today. So yeah, it's uh, it's not necessarily the funniest trailer, but uh, I I think when you see it, uh, it's a little bit funnier to see than it is just to hear it. But uh, I guess they also need you to go through to a, a, a request this uh to get on to your to nearby theater if you go to jkstudios.com slash go west and uh, you can attempt to get this to come to your uh, a theater because i mean it's a small independent film uh by the original cast of coc now called jk studios and this is a this is a gutsy maneuver to try to make a film it's very low budget and uh, a few modern bits of humor even though it looks like it's set in old independence missouri uh which i uh, I'm, I don't live that far from Independence, Missouri, really. That's that's kind of in my area of the world. An area of Missouri is down south of me is where Independence is, so that's kind of fun. Uh, but uh, the synopsis here says, Go West tells the story of two sisters traveling on the dangerous Oregon Trail, meeting hilarious characters and encountering crazy obstacles along the way. 
So if you're interested in seeing that, go request it to come to a theater near you, which I should probably go and do that to try to get it to come to a theater nearby me. All right, now we have something coming from Disney and Pixar, their 28th feature film, and I figured I would just go ahead and share it, even though I'm really not that interested. For centuries, we have called out to the universe, looking for answers. In 2024, the universe calls back. Bring us your leader. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Honey, now is a really bad time. Okay. Bye. I love you. I love you. I love you. This is new. Uh, no. No, no. No, no, no. No, thank you! Whoa. Please state the name of your home world. Uh, Earth? Welcome, leader of uh, Earth. We are the United Advanced Species of the Universe. I think there's been a mistake. You're not the leader of our Earth? Sorry for the mix-up. Commence memory wipe. No, wait! <clears throat> I am the leader of Earth. Why is your voice different? I, I've always talked like this since I was a kid, which I'm obviously not anymore. But yes, I run the planet. The trial of uh, Earth can proceed. Uh-oh. Until then, as you say on uh, Earth, okay, bye. I love you. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. bye. I, love I, love I love you. I love you. Uh... The talk of the communiverse. If mom could see me now. I know what you mean. I ate my mother at birth, but in moments of great success, I regret it. That's a thing for your species? No, just a me thing. Everyone was shocked. <laughs> so this is scheduled to be spring 2024. And its uh, description here is an out of world teaser trailer for Disney Pixar's 28th feature film, Elio, is now available. Cash, uh, the well, it says additions to the voice cast. Can't we get the main voice cast? Come on. Uh, but it says Jamila Jamil, Brad Garrett, joined previously announced America Ferreira and Jonas Gabrib in the intergalactic misadventure that's scheduled to take off next spring, March 1st. And the description says, For centuries, people have called out to the universe looking for answers. In Disney Pixar's all new movie, Elio, the universe answers back, or the universe calls back. The original feature film introduces Elio, an underdog with an active imagination, who finds himself inadvertently beamed up to the Communiverse, an interplanetary organization with representatives from galaxies far and wide, mistakenly identified as the Earth's ambassador to the rest of the universe, and completely unprepared for that kind of pressure, Elio must form new bonds with eccentric alien life forms, survive a series of formidable trials, and somehow discover who he is truly meant to be. This is directed by Adrian Molina, screenwriter and co-director of Coco. Well, that's a good sign. Coco was good. And produced by Mary Alice Drum, associate producer of Coco. The film features the voices of America Ferrera as Helio's mom, Olga, Jamil Jamil, or Jamila Jamil. I don't know if that's what it looks like. As Ambassador Cuesta, Brad Garrett as Ambassador Crygan, and Jonas Gabrib as the title character, Elio. And as I said, March 1st, 2024. Normally when I would see something from Pixar or Disney, I used to get super excited about it. I don't anymore. Although, well, it's got some uh, potential. Uh, but it seemed, you know, a lot of the jokes and everything seemed very, very predictable. You kind of saw where it was going early on. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll see if they get my interest as it goes later on. Here's something you're only going to hear about one time. Because this is going to be an R-rated film, and I don't cover R-rated films, but it's a Marvel film. It's a Spider-Man villain. So I thought we would uh, check out the trailer. This is Craven the Hunter. My son, never show mercy. They are prey. The predators. Boys, your mother is dead. She died because you sent her away. She was weak, 
sick in her mind. You know my business, yes? Power is about strength. If you show weakness, you will give our enemies an opening. Like his mother, leave him. What happened that day? I stared death in the face, and for the first time, I saw my true self. Tell me about this hunter. They say he uses a connection with animals to track his prey. And once you're on his list, there's only one way off. The six of us, and only one of you. There's six of you now. Why do you hunt? My father puts evil into the world. I take it out. I think you're some kind of honor. You are exactly like our father. Just another man hunting for a trophy. We're murderers. Isn't that what he taught us? You don't get to do that to me anymore. Mr. Teglin? Mr. Teglin? Where's Mr. Teglin? Oh, you're standing in him. Oh, you just figure that out now? There is an animal in each one of us. Don't you want to know why they call me the rhino? So that's Craven the Hunter. It's due out in October. I have to go try to remember to edit out so a little bit of mild language in this one as well. Uh, and it's all it says for description is once you're on his list, there's only one way off. Aaron Taylor Johnson is Craven the Hunter. There is a red band trailer available uh, if you want to see the whole thing and all its uh, horrifically bloody glory, I'm sure, with probably a lot of language. Uh, this is a really bloody, gory type of trailer, even without being the Red Band trailer. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a seriously hard R movie, and they've reinvented the character very much. You basically want to see him uh, being attacked by a lion. He's been supposed to be hunting. He's failing at hunting, and uh, the the lion bleeds into his open, into uh, Sergei Kravinov's open wound, and I guess that's he's going to get superpowers from that, and he starts becoming more of an animal and can communicate with animals, and... Uh, okay. And we even have a rhino that turns into rhino instead of the guy in the suit. So they, they really, really just reinvented everything here. So uh, it's it's not the Craven the Hunter that I know um, from from comic book reading uh, or anything like that. So uh, but it is what it is. Uh, something I'm going to throw in here real quick is I see there is a nine days ago we got a, a trailer on for Netflix for a live action version of One Piece. So uh, take a listen. If you happen to be a fan of that anime, I think my wife has watched some of it, but uh, here, here we go. Ever since I was a kid, the sea's been calling. So, I'm setting out to follow my dreams. I'm gonna be king of the pirates. All I need is a loyal crew. And I think together we'd make a pretty good team. We're heading up to the Grand Line. A treacherous stretch of ocean with bigger islands and bigger pirates. <laughs> Careful with that. I don't work for you. I'm sensing a little bit of tension amongst the crew. Not, Not a, crew. a crew. We haven't sailed together for very long, but I know we've got each other's backs. Gamma 
old world fighters call out their finishing moves. No, they don't. So August 31st, coming to Netflix, One Piece as a live action. Is this a movie or a series? <laughs> I think it's going to just be a movie. Uh, there's been a lot of animes being adapted into uh, movies here lately on Netflix. Uh, and uh, the ones I've watched, I, I did like. I mean, they did uh, Full Metal Alchemist, uh, which I did kind of enjoy that one. That was actually made in Japan. This is completely English speaking. Uh, but not every time that they do this has they have they made something successful. But this looks like it could be fun. I'm not that familiar with the One Piece uh, manga or anime. I think I maybe have watched one episode. I know the lead character is this kid in the hat, and he's kind of rubbery and can't really feel pain. He's like impervious for some reason. I can't remember why. But you know that's it's coming. So uh, one last thing. Uh, well, you know what? it's almost kind of too late to do it because secret. I've got a trailer here for Secret Invasion. It's already started, and we already talked about it. So. I think we're just going to move on to our next feature. Oh, Want to see a movie? Yeah. Any good? It was bad? I'm fuzzy on the whole good-bad thing. My eyeballs could have been sucked from their sockets. I like it a lot. The best movie ever made. A, a fandom, fandom Nexus, Nexus movie review. The Flash. Finally coming to theaters in his own movie. Starring Ezra Miller, which I don't think we need to get into Ezra Miller's problems. Really, do we? We don't want to. I don't want to drag the show down. But yeah, we know he's got some legal problems, and maybe DC should have taken an opportunity to recast, maybe reshoot some of it. But I guess it costs a lot of money to reshoot. But they, you know, they didn't really spend a lot of money on the CGI on this, but they claim the CGI looks bad on purpose. Uh, this is from director Andy Muschietti. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but that's what it looks like. He is going to also be doing Batman the Brave and the Bold. I'm curious what he does with that because, you know, I'm, I'm used to that being a slightly lighter toned series and there's guest star superheroes in it uh, from the animated series. I've never seen any of the comics, but the animated series from, oh, what was it, about 15 years ago, I think there was when that, that cartoon, which I, I believe you can still watch on Max, uh, it should hopefully still be there, had Dietrich Bader as the voice of Batman. Uh, they had some uh, McDonald's toys even as well. It was a great cartoon. It's a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what they do for a movie. But uh, this, of course, we're not here to talk about that. We're talking about The Flash as in theaters. We're on Livingston playing his father even. Uh, we had Maribel Vardu as Nora Allen. Uh, so for his parents. And uh, they, of course, well, his father gets locked away and accused and convicted of killing Nora Allen. Barry Allen's mother, and that's sort of the main premise of that. Barry Allen, from that point, went on to study uh, crime investigation and stuff like that, trying to find a way that he could clear his father and prove his innocence. Well, what would happen if you found out you could time travel and prevent your mother's death, and then you became someone else? But instead of running all the way back to get to the point that you left, something interferes with you and knocks you off at the point where you run into your... 18 year old self who is more annoying than even you are because Ezra Miller is still annoying as the flash and his younger self is even more annoying. However, the story is good. Uh, we've got some pretty good performances by uh, Sasha Kelly. Uh, yeah. She's Cara zor uh, Supergirl. Of course we all went mainly to see Michael Keaton playing Batman again. Uh, and Jeremy Irons, of course, back as Alfred Pennyworth only during the times of the beginning when you see him with, Ben Affleck's Batman, uh, as Michael Keaton's Batman explains it later, that when he altered that time, he didn't just Back to the Future make an alternate timeline. So now this alternate timeline has its own past, and so when he makes that change, not only does he change the future, but it changes the past as well. So uh, speaking of Back to the Future, uh, now Michael J. Fox was not the star of it. Now it is the uh, original actor from Back to the Future, uh, uh, Stoltz, Eric Stoltz, uh, who was originally going to... I can't remember why they swapped over to Michael J. Fox. I think Eric Stoltz at some point could not complete filming it, but they did start filming the movie with him. Uh, so, yeah, they, they went with that idea that he actually completed the movie. And, you know, So, like, the past had changed. But this is essentially the Flashpoint Paradox, uh, which they've got an animated movie of, and, um, I, you know, it was based off a comic book series. And overall, I did enjoy this. This was a good time at the movies. It was more fun than it had any right to be. Uh, Ezra Miller is kind of annoying, but there is some neat action sequences. And the only real complaints I've heard, other than Ezra Miller, is the CGI looking really bad 
And uh, some people have complained about what it looks like when the Flash is running. Well, and one person even had said, why didn't they just do what they what Marvel did with Quicksilver? Well, you, of course, you wouldn't want to make it exactly look like Quicksilver because it's you don't want to be like a copycat, right? And the difference being is that Quicksilver it just moves extremely fast as a mutant. The Flash enters into something called the Speed Force, which is almost like this alternate sort of reality. So while he's in it, he looks like he's moving slow motion, but he's probably actually moving extremely fast, just faster than our eyes would see it. So it kind of makes sense that he almost seems to be moving slow when he's inside the Speed Force. But like the entire realm, when we're following him in the Speed Force, everything looks different around him. Unless they slow everything down to slow motion where he's moving kind of normal speed so we kind of get an idea. There is scenes like that where he's rescuing a bunch of babies falling out of a building. Don't ask. You'll have to see it in the movie. Uh, where we kind of get him moving at normal speed. But when he's running the speed force, he almost looks like he's doing the same maneuver as a speed skater. Uh, which I found to be interesting. I didn't mind that at all. I thought it looked kind of cool. Uh, and I got the idea that he was inside the speed force. But, of course, Barry finds out that he can travel back in time and then makes the decision that if he just does one thing, he can save his mother's life uh so yeah with that of course that alteration everything changes and now he's got to set things right and even try to get himself his powers uh thinking he can set things back to normal by just giving himself his powers and and taking care of other things realizing that there is no superman when general zod actually makes his arrival on earth um so it's basically trying to get Superman back, finding out that there is no Superman because uh, you got a Supergirl, and she's got a very different attitude. And, you know, it starts out, everybody, nobody really wants to help him, but he's, he kind of wins them over. Uh, the more grown-up as uh, Barry Allen is more serious than he was in the Justice League movie. He's a little bit less annoying. Uh, but Ezra Miller himself is just kind of annoying in this. Uh, I, I liked him actually better in the Fantastic Beasts movie because he didn't have a whole lot of dialogue and much he needed to do, so there's not much he could really ruin. But, you know, he doesn't actually manage to ruin this movie. I actually, like I said, it's it's more fun than it had any right to be, and I actually do recommend it. Philip and I both had a good time. It was actually a good movie, and, of course, the highlight is, of course, Michael Keaton coming in as Batman, although most of his action sequences looks like there's some CGI that took over to get him to be able to move a little bit more like the Batman we would expect. Uh, I, I had also pulled out a... Uh, bit of stuff about the flashpoint paradox uh so let me go and update you on uh, what how it happened in the comics so this is barry allen waking up discover everything and everyone around him has changed he's not the flash doesn't have powers uh his mother's alive his his father henry died of a heart attack three three years previously uh alive and in prison in his own time but in this timeline he wasn't Captain Cold is Central City's greatest hero. The Justice League was never established, and even Superman is seemingly non-existent. Gotham City has a Batman, but it's uh, he throws criminals off buildings. Uh, Cyborg and Batman have a conference with a group of superheroes to discuss how Wonder Woman's Amazons have conquered the United Kingdom, while Aquaman's Atlanteans have sunk the rest of Western Europe. The battle between the two has caused massive death and destruction, and America is similarly, similarly endangered. The heroes cannot cooperate to find a solution, and the meeting is ended. Barry Allen drives to the Batcave where Batman attacks him. Batman is revealed to be Thomas Wayne in this timeline. His son Bruce was killed by a robber instead of his wife and, 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 and himself. And in this timeline, Thomas brutally beat the robber to death for murdering Bruce, and Martha went insane at the loss of her son, becoming the Joker. So you see, it was a very different world, and that's kind of what this movie is doing. It's like, well, the past is going to be altered as well as the future. Um, I don't want to read this entire thing. There's a very long thing I, I found out that gave the entire uh, story of this here. There was a prelude on The Flash, Volume 3, numbers 8 through 12. Then you have Flashpoint series, number 1 through 5, crossover with Booster Gold. Uh, there's uh, some issues that were Batman-centric. A lot of different things going on there, a lot of one-shot things. Uh, but when this was put back to- together... Uh, and I guess there is Flashpoint 10, 10th Anniversary Omnibus was put out in April 2021. That's interesting. Has it really been so long that this all happened? But when it came back, though, uh, that's when we also got the new 52, and they tried to reboot the DC Universe. It didn't go over very well, and they've actually rebooted the <laughs> the new 52 since then. Um Interesting uh, little notes on from video games in the 2013 game Injustice Gods Among Us. There's a Flashpoint inspired design of Batman and Aquaman, Wonder Woman, and Deathstroke as downloadable content. The 2015 Batman Arkham Knight had Batman's Flashpoint design for a Batman as a downloadable content. 2017 game Injustice 2 featured the Flashpoint version of Wonder Woman making a cameo in Green Arrow's alternate ending as a member of the Multiverse Justice League. In a 2011 video game, DC Universe Online, 
launched its 40th episode, World of Flashpoint, in 2021, featuring Queen Wonder Woman, Emperor Aquaman, Batman Thomas Wayne, and The Flash. So this was kind of a big event. Uh, DC has always had big events like that. You had the Crisis on Infinite Earth and stuff like that, where their concept of the multiverse really got started. But this is how, in the films, they've managed to bring a multiverse together. And we do see a multiverse in the film towards the end. Uh, universes where Christopher Reeve's Superman still is, Nicolas Cage's Superman still is, uh, Adam West's Batman. You know, you get to see a lot of different characters pop up. It was really kind of neat to see at the end. I hope I didn't spoil anything for you, but uh, I thought it was a very, very interesting. Uh, but anyways, we will move on to the next thing. A Stan Lee documentary is on Disney+. Plus. Definitely well worth a watch. Stan Lee did so many interviews, and there's been so many little documentaries and stuff made about him. I've even got, uh, when I bought my special edition version of the the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie, it had Kevin Smith sitting down with Stan Lee in a little conversation. Uh, I've also seen documentaries, I think I checked them out on the library, that kind of followed him around, and you get to see Stan with his wife, uh, Joni, I believe. Uh, Stan has even put out an autobiography comic book, uh, but there's all lots of him talking about you know himself. And so they've gathered all out of that audio to where he kind of narrates himself. And they uh, sometimes with uh, little figures, they they show parts of his younger life and they, a lot of actual live footage. And they kind of walk you through some major points of Stanley's life, uh, not without getting too much into the with the formation of the comics code, but how he wants to find the comics code because he got a government uh, mandate, I guess. I don't know. Well, he was asked by the government to do something to combat the drug problem, and he did a, an, a, an issue dealing with Harry Osborne having a drug problem, and the uh, the Comics Code would not approve that because they don't even want to deal with the topic of drugs, but the publisher at Marvel told Stan, you know what, go ahead. But it, it's really, really good stuff, going through, walking through a lot of his career. He talks a lot also about uh, Steve Ditko uh, wanted more credit and considered himself to be a more of a creator of Spider-Man. Uh, Stan Lee had given Steve credit for like the look and the, the design, but uh, the idea was was Stan's, but not the look of it. And Steve Ditko felt like he should have gotten more credit because uh, he says the the idea was not what gave you the the creation of the character. And so Steve Ditko eventually did leave Marvel uh, over this issue, which I thought was very very interesting. Um, and as I did see some other stuff while I was at the exhibit over the weekend, where. Uh, Steve Ditko, of course, had drawn a cover for Amazing Fantasy 15, where you first see the Amazing Spider-Man, uh, but they didn't really like that cover, and so Jack Kirby, of course, then drew his cover, which became more iconic and was uh, been repeated and replicated as you know, the exhibit showed over time. Uh, but it was definitely worth a watch. It was very interesting. Uh, of course, if you love the man Stantley, you're going to enjoy watching a documentary about him. It just comes down to that. Very, very simple to look at uh, in that direction. But now I do want to talk a little bit about this exhibit. Uh, there was a lot of different things. Uh, I mean, I uh, there was pictures, I mean, artwork, original artwork that was used in the comics all over the place. And I was taking photos of that stuff. I took some selfies with Spider-Man stuff. wish I hadn't gone there by my own so somebody could have taken a picture with me. Uh, but they had uh, some framings um, or some... I don't know what you would you call it, a display slash plaque that went through the various different eras of Spider-Man. I mean, this exhibit was meant to encourage people who had watched the movies to learn more ab about the comic books of Spider-Man and, and educate just some of the history of what's happened in the comics, the writers, the artists that have worked on them through the decades. And it was very interesting. Of course, now there you, you do get to see various uh, costumes and props from the from the movies. We saw a couple of Tom Holland suits, um, like the the stealth suit. Uh, we do get to see one of his Stark suits. Uh, no Way Home, I believe, was it? Or, no, wait, Far From Home. Far From Home, I think, is where he first debuts the uh, black and red suit to match a little bit more, actually, what the original intention was. He was supposed to be wearing black and red in the comics. But, you know, there's... Back then, you wanted to be able to show where light hit things, and that's where the blue highlights kind of hit in, and the highlights eventually just kind of took over to where he looked like he was just wearing blue. Uh, but like I said, there was a lot of stuff going through talking about the Steve Ditko and Stan Lee era and all the different things that came about of that and all the new villains popped up. There was even features about each villain on various walls that you could look at. Uh, oh, got to see, by the way, one of Dr. Octopus's, uh, I guess Claw is the right one. One of the mothers was telling her kid, oh, that's a Dr. Octopus Claw from Spider-Man 2. It wasn't the full arm, but it was the, the claw. Uh, they had Green Goblin's mask and Pumpkin Bomb. They also had from Amazing Spider-Man 2 that Green Goblin suit that um, the one uh, younger Green Goblin was wearing when they had a Harry Osborn Green Goblin in that one. 
a lot of neat stuff. Uh, a lot of great photo opportunities. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, one kid, one kid was scared to death of a uh, bust of the lizard, as depicted in Amazing Spider-Man, uh, the movie. Uh, he was kind of terrified of it, and the, the the mom was trying to point out that look, but there's a green goblin and a pumpkin palm over here. Look at this. <laughs> and, you know. Uh, one thing I found interesting, I mean, you got a lot of generations in there, a lot of eras. You get, a, of course, the, the John Romita style of when that came along. Uh, yeah, where it talks about John Romita. And you can't really see the text in my photos. But uh, the entrance of John Romita and the different, you can see the style that he drew. Because he, he, he still kept characters skinny. They weren't, like, overly massive. But he had just a little bit more muscle detail and uh, more rounded, I would say, in his look. And I think they even say that in the, the Stan Lee documentary. I really liked his style, uh, and uh, let's see, I believe, uh, yeah, he was, of course, the one, they do have a the one shot, of course, where Mary Jane pops up, uh, you just hit the jackpot, and, uh, of course, his designs on Mary Jane and bringing her in, um, trying to move ahead here to some different things, like the next, uh, oh, yeah, here was the Spider-Man in Society, Stan takes a stand, this is where we're talking about Stan Lee trying to keep it relevant to the young audience and talking to some of the issues that were going on at the time in the 60s, including the drug issues. But I want to get to the next artists because, uh, oh, my gosh, there was also, I forgot about this display here, a lot of different merchandise that they showed. Uh, and even one, uh, it's a figure still in package, but it's a figure I actually have. Uh, they even showed the designs John Romina did for what became the Thanksgiving Day Spider-Man balloon. The wedding, they had an entire wall display for the wedding of Peter Parker and Mary Jane. This actually was one of Stan Lee's ideas. He wanted to keep Mary Jane around and thought this was a good way to do it. And uh, they they did a massive event. Stan Lee was at the time writing, uh, I think even with John Romita Sr., uh, was doing a, a comic strip there for a good long time. And they coordinated with the comic strip, the comic book, to have the wedding in both. But they they had someone design a dress for Mary Jane, uh, which that design, that original artwork was on the wall. And, of course, they had an actual wedding out in, uh, I believe, like uh, Shea Stadium out there in New York, and had an entire event. And Stanley actually officiated a wedding when they had two people playing as Peter Parker or Spider-Man and Mary Jane, and guests including a few of his villains and other characters from the comic books. So it was a really, really big, neat, cool event. And... You know, now you have modern artists that, uh, modern writers, modern Marvel, have decided they just split them any way they possibly can because they have no idea what to do with her now. Like Dan Slott was the first to do it, and they've even done it here recently. But funny thing I noticed with all the different artists that were mentioned and all the different contributions, like even the the uh, the writer and artist, uh, the writer who took over from Stan, who was wrote the death of Gwen Stacy and a lot of other different stories. You know, even the Green Goblin, a lot of different stories. He's credited, but you get to a certain point. They don't talk about Dan Slott or any of the current writers or any of that. It's just dropped. But they do suddenly bring up Miles Morales and talk about him coming into existence and had a statue out there of Miles Morales and a little section dedicated to the Spider-Verse. But you don't get to talk about a lot of the writers uh, since then. You know, uh, I mean, you even get to talk about some of the artists like Mark Bagley, who was one of my favorites, and then Todd McFarlane, who was another favorite. Who Todd McFarlane is the one who really originally made, made Peter more spidery the way he moved and even started making the webbing. Uh, more tangled looking in various fashions. Now, but yeah, Tom McFarlane did a lot of stuff to originate, and Mark Bagley kind of followed suit of trying to do what Tom McFarlane did. But you know, there's great little placards to all the different artists and writers out there. And I, if if it comes into your town, I definitely recommend you go check it out. And if you're in Kansas City, definitely you have to go and check this out. It was great. Uh, it cost me twenty four fifty, I think, overall with uh with like tax, I guess included, not to mention six dollars in parking to go. Uh, it's worth going the one time. I don't think I'd go back a second round because I, I, there wasn't really much that I didn't already know. But it was once you've I read everything in there. Once you've read it all, there's not much more to do. Uh, but it is very, very cool to see and a lot of great photo opportunities as well. Oh, and guess what? I have some audio to share with you that I recorded while I was there. So let me share that with you right now. All right, folks, here I am. I am inside the Spider-Man Beyond Amazing exhibit here at Union Station in Kansas City. Uh, I believe this is going to be a traveling event, uh, but I, have, of course, had to take the opportunity to come down there. I'm going to be allowed to take some pictures, so I'll share some of those, of course, on our Facebook page and also on my Instagram. I'll, I'll of course, make an announcement of that at the end of the program. But I wanted to share some of the things that I'm seeing. So far, I got to see even some Kansas City exclusives with Andre Risen, who was uh, one of our players for the Kansas City Chiefs. 
he used to call himself Spider-Man, and so they made a special edition comic book uh, that was for Andre Risen of the Kansas City Chiefs. It was uh, number 23, I think volume 2 of Amazing Spider-Man. I kind of almost wonder if I don't have that issue somewhere, but I don't have the Kansas City Chiefs exclusive specifically, but it looked familiar to me. Uh, but I am now going to go through the exhibit. I'll tell you some of the interesting things I picked up and learned. There's a lot of stuff I already know, but I'll do, at least tell you about the exhibit. Right now I'm in a room that's like the opening room, and it's got a little different facts of a, a bit of a timeline that's popping up on screens, a lot of video screens, a lot of really great uh, comic panel pages. Oh, there's even spider going over here. Uh, very, really, Oh, some Mark Bagley art over here. That's very, very cool. Uh, but it's got like some Sunny Wicked events in Spider-Man's life. Like I saw in 1984, it mentioned the, uh, the black suit. 2002, first Spider-Man movie appears in theaters. Yep. All right, well, I'm going to make my way into here. Uh, oh, oh, my gosh, there's a fantastic 3D model here. Well, I'm going to stop and take some pictures. But let me read some of this to you before I take pictures. It says, Spider-Man has always been a different kind of superhero. His origin story was different. His powers were different. His costume was different. He wasn't an alien or mythical figure or even a full-grown adult. Just a teenager with teenage problems. He didn't even want to be a hero at first. Only taking up the role after tragedy taught him that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Since his debut in 1962, Spider-Man has become an international icon. He has appeared in every form of popular media, inspired an entire Spider-Verse of related heroes and villains, and made millions of fans of all ages from every nation on Earth. This exhibition will take you from the Web Slinger's humble beginnings to his present day status as one of the world's most popular fictional characters. You'll meet Peter Parker's loyal friends and his most enduring foes, relive his greatest strategies and triumphs, and encounter many of the other spectacular spider characters who have appeared over the last six decades. Welcome to the Web Slinging wall crawling world of the amazing Spider-Man. Alright, well now it's time for me to go and take pictures. Well, here's a fun fact that I didn't know. This is Strange Tales number 97, and they've got a, a copy here of page two. This is a story called Goodbye to Linda Brown, and features two characters named Uncle Ben and Aunt May, who starred in this as Stan Lee written and Steve Ditko written, uh, drawn mystery about a vanishing girl a full two months before the publication of Peter Parker's origin story. How interesting. The existence of these prototypes is a reminder that the artistic process is a commercial, headline-driven industry, and more complex than we generally imagine. And looking even at the artwork, Work. I mean, you, this definitely ain't me and Uncle Ben when you take a look at them as, as, as Steve Disco drew them later with Spider-Man. The only difference is uh, is Linda here, which I think she disappeared. But interesting, they were found a way to brought her, bring her back in the actual Spider-Man comics would be really cool. Well, here's an interesting fact I didn't know, and I don't think they mentioned it in the Stanley uh, documentary that's on Disney Plus right now, but uh, May 1941, Captain America Comics number 3 is the first time that you see anything written by Stan Lee, and it was, uh, apparently back in those days you had to have a couple of pages of prose fiction to meet some postal requirements for a second class mailing, and Joe Simon figured, well, nobody read these little text stories, so it wouldn't do any harm to, to let Stan write it, and that's when Stan decided to call himself Stan Lee, because he wanted to write real stuff later, as he mentioned in the documentary that's currently on Disney Plus which by the way I do recommend alright so as I'm standing here they have a Secrets of Spider-Man which I guess is something they printed fairly early on it looks like it might be uh well, no, it looks like st uh, Steve Ditko's style, but they do explain some different things on the powers. And I guess this is the first time they established that Spidey was wearing, uh, like, one-way mirror-style lenses, uh, which, so no one could see in, but he could see out. So that's always been the idea, which I thought that was something new they developed maybe for the films to try to make it, you know, more feasible than what it seemed like it has cloth over his eyes. But no, the idea was always that he had lenses on his eyes. Did not realize that. So that's been going on since the, uh, the 60s. Very interesting. So, oh, look, I actually learned something I didn't know. So this is interesting. So Ross Andrew, uh, around 1972, is the first one that really started making Spider-Man appear in New York. Uh, he even would sometimes, I guess, lean out of the windows on uh, at the 59th Street Bridge uh, and take photos, and he would use that for the backgrounds and stuff to make realistic depictions of New York in the backgrounds uh, for Spider-Man. So he kind of made it definitive that he was in New York. That's interesting because, of course, you know, most of the sixes, and we know, like, DC always has Metropolis, Gotham City, Central City, all that kind of stuff, but it's always been kind of cool that the Marvel Universe takes place in a real place. But it's very neat that he wanted to make it real. Uh, I, so I get a kick out of that. So here's a guy that definitely needs to be mentioned. Uh, I figure it's a Jerry Conway, either or Gary, probably Jerry. Uh, but he's the he took over writing in 1971 for Amazing Spider-Man, and this is the guy who's have a, a run from Amazing Spider-Man 111 to 149. Uh, he's the one to kill off Ben Stacy, Gwen Stacy, and Green Goblin, and also brought in characters like Tarantula, Hammerhead, Jacqueline and the Punisher, uh, and even had stuff like the Death of the Molten Man, the Spider-Mobile, uh, Harry Osborn becoming the Green Goblin, and also the Ant-May and Doc. 
Hancock romance that happened. Uh, very interesting. Uh, some of those, I think I have like reprints of some of this stuff. I know we got reprinted of the Punisher uh, issue. Uh, I've even got one where it says the Punisher meets Archie that's got the same cover. Uh, but he also, the very last story arc that he did was where Jackal created the clones of Spider-Man that would have repercussions later. Another thing that I found very interesting at the exhibit is uh, uh, a sort of a, a, like the last screen where you have J. Jonah Jameson admitting the reason why he uh, goes after Spider-Man so much and, uh, and, and hates on him is because he's jealous because uh, he can't respect himself while he lives. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in on this frame a little bit. I can make it full screen, but that's not going to get it too much bigger. There we go. Uh, but uh, here's J. Jonas Jameson alone in his office. Says, Am I always to be thwarted and embarrassed and frustrated by Spider-Man? I hate that costume freak more than I ever hated anyone before. I'll never be contented while he's free. All my life I've been inter interested in only one thing, making money. And yet Spider-Man risks his life day after day with no thought of reward. If a man like him is good, is a hero, then what am I? I can never respect myself while he lives. Spider-Man represents everything that I am not. He's brave, powerful, and unselfish. The truth is, I envy him. I, J. Jonah Jameson, millionaire, man of the world, civic leader, I'd give everything to, I own to be the man that he is. And yeah, Spider-Man has truly been an inspiration to a lot of people, myself, of course, included, the concept of growth, great power comes great responsibility uh, resonates even with the, the Bible tale of the talents. The parable of the talents, I should say specifically. A new look for a new era. There's where it talks about Todd McFarlane, Eric Larson, and Mark Bagley. Uh, and this is also where you get some of the early Venom comics there with Todd McFarlane. But it looks like I did not take a picture of that other writer-artist who was responsible for the death of Gwen Stacy. My goodness. Uh, something else that was fun, though, uh, there was a Sega Genesis out there with one of the red cartridges of Maximum Carnage actually going, and they were playing the intro thing, and uh, there was another family had stopped, and a father was showing his kids the game. And we were talking about how you you know used to not get uh, that many continues. You couldn't save your progress. Uh, if you wanted to leave it and come back, you'd have to leave the system on. Which I didn't really have that opportunity to do uh, uh, with us. Our Sega Genesis was plugged in the living room. Uh, well, uh, my brother's Sega Genesis, he had plugged in the living room. I had a Super Nintendo in my room, uh, but my parents did not look too kindly on leaving that on. And that's where I played the Maximum Carnage game was on a Super Nintendo. Uh, and the only way I could beat it was with a Game Genie. Uh, let's see. Oop, was that my screen here? Uh, Spider Swings in the Theaters. Yep, there's an entire section that was dedicated to the films coming around uh, May 3rd, 2002. Uh, there's some pages showing of some of the uh, kind of graphic and artwork stuff that they did for uh, from Homecoming and Far From Home. Uh, the Ultimate Reboot, they, of course, they talk about the Ultimate Spider-Man, where Mark Bagley was going on there with J uh, Brian Michael Bendis. Pardon me. Uh, and then, they have, of course, a uh, page dedicated to all the different characters we've seen in the Spider-Verse, including Spider-Ham. But no, apparently I didn't take a picture of the of the panel that was talking about that other writer artist that came along and uh, was uh, there during the time of the death of Gwen Stacy. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I've seemed to have forgotten that, but it was a fantastic exhibit. I really enjoyed looking at it. And as I mentioned before, I recommend going at least one time. Now, of course, to keep things moving, I wanted to talk about the animated series, Spider-Man and his amazing friends, which was actually um, sort of a follow-up. There was a Spider-Man series that didn't quite make it all the way to everybody uh, seeing it, apparently. And so this was probably the first one that you got to see on Saturday mornings on NBC with a total of 24 episodes, three seasons. Uh, there actually were a few comics that were released based on it. The Triumph of the Green Goblin, Opposites Attack, Spider-Man and His Amazing Coworkers, and Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. And this is where you also... Um, wow, look, they got a thing of every episode. This is cool. So we started out, with, of course, with The Triumph of the Green Goblin, had The Crime of All Centuries, The Fantastic Mr. Frump, Sunfire, which, of course, he's a mutant. He appeared there. Swarm, a very weird character. Seven Little Superheroes. I believe that's the chameleon who went in there. And there's a lot of other guest star heroes. That was one of the things that was fun about this. All the guest stars that would pop up, like the X-Men and Magneto, different villains. Video Man. Uh, Spidey Goes to Hollywood. Uh, the prison plot uh, with Magneto there. That's before we get to see the X-Men. The Vengeance of Loki, where Thor makes an appearance. Knights and Demons, Pawns of the Kingpin, and then the Quest of the Red Skull. Season 2 featured the origin of Iceman, along came a Spidey, and a Firestar is born. 
They've got Spider-Man unmasked, where the Sandman thinks he actually unmasked him, and actually does, and they managed to trick him. Transylvania Connection, where Dracula wants uh, wants, uh, Firestar. Oh, what was her name? Angelica Jones. The Education of a Superhero, where instead of a villain, we get a a guy who gets the powers of Video Man and wants to be a hero. Attack of the Arachnid, which apparently mirrors uh, an episode of the Spider-Man series that had run previously. Uh, the Origin of the Spider Friends, where it tells that entire story while the Blue Beetles are running around. Spidey meets the girl from tomorrow. He falls in love with uh, Peter Parker, falls in love with a future girl. The X Men Adventure, guess where that is? And then Mission Save the Guard Star, which they had another uh, other characters coming in there. Well, uh, yeah, and I guess season two only had the uh, origin stories listed as far as this page here. This is the, I'm looking at the Marvel fandom database. But this is where, of course, we got introductions to characters like, you know, Iceman, of course, a mutant. They thought about having the Human Torch be a flame guy, but they wanted a female. So they came up with Angelica Jones, Firestar, and they thought, well, just make her another mutant. This uh, series was originally broadcast on NBC as a Saturday morning cartoon. The series ran for three seasons from September 12, 1981 to September 10, 1983. I would have been four years old when this series came on, and I remember watching it, and I, I gained a love for Spider-Man uh, from this point. And I got even more love as I, I, I learned more what Spider-Man is about as I got older, and I started buying some actual comics. Uh, the animated series was noticeably more popular than the solo Spider-Man animated series that aired around the same time. You can watch both of these on Disney+. Plus. It has also become more well-known in recent years, thanks in part to syndication on the JetX programming block. As of 2006... As with the majority of other Disney acquired Marvel Comics animated series, there are no plans to release the show to DVD. It was released in Region 2 in late 2008. Uh, so, yeah, this is Peter Parker with Bobby Drake and Angelica Jones. They uh, they come in as uh, boarding in with uh, Aunt May. She wants to run a boarding house, so they all live in the same house. They manage to make a little hidden crime lab or secret headquarters uh, that I guess, yeah, I think if I remember correctly, Tony Stark helps them with. Uh, after they help him out in like the uh, premiere episode or something, or I think, you know, but I think you get some answers to why that is, and maybe how they become the Spider Friends or something like that. Uh, I'd have to go and watch all this, but yeah, it was a great show. It was a little cheesy, of course. They're not allowed to punch, nor I think even kick anyone. Uh, so Spider Man basically webbed and then did fe- feats of strength. Ice Man, of course, would use his ice powers. Fire Star would surround someone with a fire, you know, doing different things. But they, they in the eighties, they really had to keep the the violence down. Uh, and uh, in the '90s series, we even see that uh, you know um, John Semper said that with with the '90s series that he didn't want to have Spider-Man just punching everybody. He wanted to do something different. So he would have him kick him, but he would try to come up with creative ways to deal with with villains instead of just punching them. Voice cast included Dan Gilvezan as Peter Parker, Spider-Man, Frank Welker. Of course, we know him as. Fred from the Scooby-Doo, and so many different characters. Frank Welker, just look him up on IMDb, and you'll be amazed how many different characters he played. I mean, heck, in this one, he's Bobby Drake, Iceman, he's also Flash Thompson, and even Ms. Lion, the dog. Uh, Kathy Garber was the voice of Firestar. June Foray was the voice of Aunt May. Uh, she's, of course, was everything. My goodness. Uh, Rocky from Rocky and Bullwinkle. So many different characters, June Foray. Uh, Dick Tufield was a narrator in Season 1, and then Stan Lee took over in Seasons 2 and 3 to narrate. William Woodson played J. Jonah Jameson. William Marshall as Tony Stark, Iron Man, and also Juggernaut. Chris Lotta was Sandman. Dennis Marks as the Green Goblin. And Michael Bell for Dr. Octopus. Now, Michael Bell, of course, you might know him also playing Duke on G.I. Joe and even the premiere episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, he had a, he did also some other Marvel stuff. He also uh, voiced Cyclops in an X-Men, uh, Pride of the X-Men. So, I mean, so this was a great series, and I remember watching this on Saturday mornings, and I, uh, at some point they did bring it in with an Incredible Hulk series. Now, the Incredible Hulk, I remember from the live-action series, uh, sort of terrified me. I was terrified of when he would turn into the Hulk with the live-action, but then he was brought into a cartoon. I was able to look at the Incredible Hulk differently as seeing that this is a cartoon character. I was still, I still didn't become a, quite a fan of the Incredible Hulk, <clears throat> but I was able to look at, oh, my gosh, he's supposed to be a Marvel hero. So I looked at him differently. So it was it was during this block of animation from Marvel Animation that I was able to get a different look of things. Now this has become such a popular series with uh, people my age that uh, there is there are toys uh, a sets it'll cost you about eighty dollars from Entertainment Earth. I'm planning to order it where they they get a figure of uh, that basically look like this series all three in a box and the box actually has like the title screen look. Which, if this was any bigger, I would save it to my computer. Then, you know, <laughs> there is a picture of the title screen over here at the Marvel Animated Fandom page, uh, which pretty much has a lot of the same information uh, that the other one had. 
January 2009, IGN dubbed the series the 59th best animated television series, which beat out Spider-Man at 84. The Spectacular Spider-Man and X-Men are the only two Marvel series to beat the series at 30 and 13, respectively. Uh, in the 2009 video game Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2, if the player chooses the anti-registration side, you can talk to Firestar and ask how she feels teaming up with her old buddy Spider-Man and Iceman again, which is, of course, a reference to this series. Rotten Tomatoes ranks this series amongst one of the top 100 superhero series, with this series at 48, above Big Hero 6, and 100 Spider-Woman at 89. Iron Man Armored Adventures 86. Well, there's a lot of other different ones that mentions, but... Uh, yeah, just this always had a pretty good reception, and it's got a lot of nostalgia connected with it. If they were to show this series now, I don't know if it would necessarily have the same impact. Uh, I don't know. But Wikipedia says this series was an attempt by NBC to replicate some of the success ABC enjoyed with the Super Friends franchise. The makers of the show originally intended the stars to be Spider-Man, Iceman, and the Human Torch, which I mentioned before. However, legal issues about the rights of the Human Torch character, which had also plagued Marvel once before, the 1978 Fantastic Four cartoon, led to the Human Torch being replaced by a new character, Firestar, who had similar powers but was a mutant like Iceman. Okay, so I thought... They just wanted a female, but no, they couldn't really get... They were having problems with the rights for the Human Torch, which probably has something to do with the name, because there was a Human Torch in the early days of uh, Atlas Comics, and it was uh, an android who who lit, lit fire. And I wonder if the original creator of uh, the, the name still had some rights to the name of the Human Torch. Don't know. But yeah, this was a, uh, a great... Oh, Lightwave, that's the character I was trying to remember earlier. Her name was Aurora Dante, like her half-brother Bobby Drake. A light wave is a mutant. She can manipulate and control light. Now, I don't know if she's ever popped up in uh, any of the uh, comic books. I'm not that familiar with light wave, but I do remember that issue. And I, remember, uh, I, I saw a picture of her when I was going through the episode titles. She was in one of the final episodes. Ooh, even Hans Conried played the chameleon in Seven Little Superheroes. That, there's a lot of great people who worked on this show. And if you haven't gotten a chance to check it out, even Alan Young is Mr. Frump, you know, later known as Scrooge McDuck. You can find it all on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I have found myself sometimes when I'm, you know, I'm trying to get myself to sleep, I'll turn this on and just let it play and, and just watch a little bit until I go to sleep. It is a, a great old show. I've got a lot of fond memories of watching it, and hopefully you do too, and hopefully this has brought a few memories up. And if you've never watched this before, or if you haven't watched it with your kids, show it to your kids on Disney+. Plus. Have some fun. It is a great, great show. But it's time for me to wrap this up. We've gone on long enough, I figure. Make sure you visit our website, NeverlandPodcast.com. You can find everything there, including finding links if you happen to have a podcast yourself. Uh, my podcast reviews. You can get in there and uh, set up an account and find all your reviews from uh, around the world, and they get, they'll get emailed to you. So you can find all your reviews and find an easy way to have some people write reviews for you. Which, by the way, if you've not reviewed the show, please do. That does help us get out to more people. Make sure you do share the show with people if you do enjoy it. And I want to, of course, thank Karen Kennedy, Ricky Pope of Christian Nerds Unite, and Darren Wilhite of the Wilhite and Wall Show for the help in making my introduction. Those are the voices that you hear. Remember, you can email me, podcast on everlandpodcast.com. We are on Twitter and Facebook. I have a group. I'm trying to get a bit more active. Uh, the fan page is, I have to log in as the, the page instead of myself, so it's kind of hard to work with. But the group is still there. You can become an official Neverlander on our website as well. You can become official Lost Boy or Pixie. Why Pixies? Because girls are too clever if they don't get lost. You'll also find links to our Patreon there, patreon.com slash neverlandpodcast, where you can donate to helping keep this show going. Also, you can find links to our shop where you can find a few fun designs. I got a few other designs in mind that you can put on T-shirts and mugs and all kinds of different fun things. I get a little bit from that that helps fund this show, which otherwise I pay completely out of my pocket. So you could really be helping me out a lot. But now, as we say every week, and as we come to the end of the show, it's time to get lost. In the adventure! And we'll see you next time.